I see you know a lot.
gracious to all, including God, right? So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you for a beautiful, wonderful time together. Thank you for the goodness and the grace that are in this people because of you, the work that you're doing in your spirit. Lord, thank you for how you've provided for us financially, spiritually, relationally. Lord, thank you for the good work of the gospel that we've seen brought about this year. And Lord, we commit this service and Lord we commit this baptism to you for the glory of King Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome. I'm glad you're here and uh, glad I found the baptistry. So sorry I was <laughs> I was a little behind there. So we were excited. We were having conversations and taking pictures and the whole thing forgot. So anyway, um, thank you. What a delight. Not just to worship the Lord together, but to celebrate in um, the ordinance of believers' baptism. Uh, baptism doesn't make anybody right with God. Um, baptism is not the way that our sins are forgiven. It's a symbol, um, symbol of what God has done for us in Jesus, and also a symbol of what He has done to us. So, as we trust in Christ and believe in Him, our sins are washed away. We're buried with Christ. We're raised to live a new life in Christ um, and to be a new creation. So this morning, we have the privilege of celebrating that together. Many of you, uh, as Christians, have been baptized, and you can remember your own baptism. Think back to what God has done in your own life, what he's done to you. Uh, but also, we can celebrate today with uh, Kim Butler. Uh, Kim is such a delight. And to be able to celebrate believers' baptism with her is a, a real blessing for us. So let's celebrate that together. Kim? I am so delighted to uh, introduce uh, Kim Butler to you, for those of you who have not met her. She is a sheer delight. And to be able to celebrate Believer's Baptism with her this morning is so wonderful. Uh, to hear her story, just sitting down and hearing how God has worked in her life and is working in her life even now, and to know that God brought her to our congregation. And, you know, it's fascinating. Not everybody knows the story, how she ended up at Woodland. So she was selling something on Facebook Marketplace, and... Uh, <laughs> One of, our, one of our members went to buy that and said, why don't you come to my church? And it was on a Wednesday, and so she showed up that night and uh, just to meet a few people, and then she was going to leave, and I guilted her into staying, if you remember. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm teaching a Bible study. It's going to really hurt my feelings if you leave. And she's like, I can't do that. And so she stuck around, and she's not left. We didn't run you off. Nope. So nope. we're so glad. And to be able to celebrate with you as you proclaim to people your trust in Jesus and your love for him is such a, such a delight. So, Kim, I'm so glad that you're here. Okay. Kim, let me ask you a couple of questions. One, do you trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for your salvation? Yes. And do you pledge your life to follow after him and to go where he tells you to go and do what he tells you to do? Yes then it is my privilege and pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ and raised to walk a new life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, the privilege that we have to share in the ordinance of believers baptism with Kim and with our congregation. Uh, my prayer is that you would use this time to strengthen our faith. Um, thank you for all you've done for us in Jesus. And we pray that we would just be relentlessly devoted to you in everything that we do. And so would you speak to our hearts and would you heal hurts and would you encourage and bless uh, us even now in this time of worship. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.
Our first scripture reading today comes from Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9. This is Isaiah's prayer to God on behalf of Israel. If only you... I gotta pick it up because I can't see it. <clears throat> if only you would tear the heavens open and come down so that mountains would quake at your presence. Thank you. Just as fire kindles brushwood and fire boils water to make your name known to your enemies so that nations would tremble at your presence. When you did awesome works that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. From ancient times, no one has heard, no one has listened to, no eye has seen any God except you who acts on behalf of the one who waits for him. You welcome the one who joyfully does what is right. They remember you in their own ways, but we have sinned and you are angry. How can we be saved if we remain in our sins? All of us have become like something unclean and all of our righteous acts are like polluted garments. All of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. No one calls on your name striving to take hold of you for you have hidden your face from us and made us melt because of, your, of our iniquity. Yet Lord, you are our father. You are the, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. Please look. All of us are your people. Our second reading is also from Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. For I will create new heavens and a new earth, for the past events will not be remembered or come to mind. Then be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I will create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her. In her, a nursing infant will no longer live only a few days, or an old man not live out his days. Indeed, the one who dies at a hundred years old will be mourned as a young man and the one who misses a hundred years will be considered cursed. People will build houses and live in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and others live in them. They will not plant and others eat. For my people's lives will be like the lifetime of a tree. My chosen ones will fully enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor without success or bear children destined for disaster. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord along with their descendants. Even before they call, I will answer. While they are speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like cattle. But the serpent's food will be dust. They will not do what is evil or destroy on my entire holy mountain, says the Lord. During the Christmas season, we focus our attention on the incarnation of our God, when God took on humanity in order to live, to die, and be raised from the dead for our salvation. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, reconciling us to himself. We use candles as part of an Advent wreath. Each week we will light a candle as a countdown to Christmas. This week we will light the hope candle as a reminder of the hope we have that God will save us from our sins and from a sin-sick world. God promises to replace sin and death with light and life. That is our hope. Stand with me and let's continue with worship.
seated. Thank you for that singing. Thanks for being here today. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Genesis, which is at the very beginning of the Bible. Um, And uh, if you don't have a copy of the Bible, uh, you can find one in the back of the seat in front of you. Uh, Just grab that. If there's not one in the seat back in front of you, ask somebody down the row or uh, in front of you or behind you to hand you one of those. And if you need a copy of Scripture, you can take that one with you. You can, just, you can have that one and make it, uh, make it your own. Uh, but Genesis is the first book in the Bible, uh, so it's real easy to get to. If you weren't sure where that is, there are plenty of people around you who aren't sure either. So just go to the beginning and start rolling through, and you'll get to chapter 13. And uh, we're continuing our study through uh, the book of 
uh, Genesis. And today we come to another part, if you will, of the introduction to the Christmas story. Um, this promise that God continues to make over and over again um, that he's going to provide a child, that there's going to be a, a, a son who is born, a child who is born, and that he's going to uh, establish this new people in a new place, in a place where they can dwell with God and they can live with him forever. And God has, des- has designed and is designing that place for us. And whenever we come together in worship, we celebrate what God has done and we participate in the place that he's made for us. And we'll read about that place uh, today in Genesis. Let me just add um, a couple of things here as we uh, begin our uh, kind of time in looking at the text this morning. Um, during the Christmas season, there are a, a lot of things that, that we do as families, as individuals, even as a church, and uh, one of those is, of course, the, the lighting of the Advent candles, and as uh, Keith and Lee explained to us earlier, this is a kind of a, a way for us to count down toward Christmas. And there are some of you who participate in the Advent season, uh, as, it's, uh, as it's called sometimes uh, with greater detail, maybe at home you're going through the calendar and you're pulling out the chocolates and feeding the kids chocolates and those sorts of things, or a whole host of different ways that you participate um, in, in Advent. Christians uh, have, if you're unfamiliar with it, have uh, for some time now, uh, thought about Christmas not just in terms of what happens on Christmas Day, but kind of the anticipation and leading up to it, even the, some of the songs that we sing, Joy to the World, that you uh, might sing, for example, this reminder, it's not just the first coming of Christ that we focus on, it's also His coming again. Uh, the fact that He has come once is kind of a confirmation that He's going to return, and when He comes to, uh, to finalize His justice, to bring about uh, the, the end of all oppression and suffering and disease and sorrow and sin and those kinds of things. Um, we, we look forward to that, even though we've known it in our own lives as we've trusted in Him, we anticipate that. Um, and so for some of you, it may be that lighting an Advent candle or, or having an Advent wreath may be uh, somewhat new. Um, these are uh, different ways that Christians seek to remind ourselves of the truth. And the only thing that God's commanded us to do in those kinds of things is the Lord's Supper and baptism, but there are other ways that we're always looking for um, kind of, if you will, traditions in our lives that help us to uh, tell the story and to remember the story. Uh, you and your family probably have at the, at the holiday season all sorts of traditions. I came from a family that had traditions, and you didn't break those. You know what I mean? If, like, if it was 6 o'clock that you were supposed to sit down for dinner for, on Christmas Eve, that's when you sat down. It didn't matter. what I, It wasn't ready. It wasn't finished. It wasn't, it was eating it raw. I mean, we're going to have that because that's kind of the tradition, if you will. Some of you at Thanksgiving, you just had your traditional Thanksgiving turkey. Turkey, you know what I mean? And regretted it, as everybody does, right? I mean, there's nobody who looks forward to turkey, you know, because I mean? you only do it once a year for a reason. There's nobody in June who's like, man, let's just put a turkey in. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know what I mean? It, and it doesn't even have to be Clark W. Griswold draw. It can just be any kind of draw. And you think, man, this is like terrible, but we got to keep doing it. You know, and grandma said, no, you're going to sit down, you're going to eat this turkey and put as much dressing as you can. You're putting water on it and you're, anything that you can to try to make it edible. And you're like, if I can just get through, then maybe I can get to, uh, you know, happiness. And, and so <laughs> it could be that you've enjoyed that season when somebody finally made the decision, no more turkey. Have you ever been there? You know what I mean? Where that, you know, dad finally comes out and it's like, we're done with this. We're having steaks. And the kids are like, he you know, this is great. No more turkey. This is awesome. So there, there are sometimes that you have these things that you do and you think, but this really doesn't help in any way. This just isn't, isn't meaningful to us. And as, as the church, as churches, we're always looking for what are things that really have meaning, right? That have a purpose for us and that help us to accomplish uh, those things. And so uh, we, we feel like that these are some practices that we can engage in. Um, you know, things like decorating our, our auditorium, our sanctuary for uh, the season that we're in becomes a reminder to us of what God has done for us. And I'm so delighted uh, this year, uh, Lee Appleby and her uh, team um, have decorated in a way that continues to remind us of what, what the Christmas season is about. You know what I mean? It's, it really is about Jesus and uh, what he has done for us and what he continues to do for us. And um, year after year as a church, if we've just been able to remind ourselves of those things. And we're always looking for new and better ways that we can, that we can do that. Um, and it may be that eventually having the turkey isn't the best thing. But until that time uh, comes, we'll continue to participate in a whole host of things with one another. 
another that become a real reminder to us of who Jesus is and what he does. And so I'm delighted to share and participate in those things with you this morning. All right, so Genesis chapter 13, we're going to read the, the entire chapter, a uh, handful of verses here that we can read through together, and I'll read them out loud, you can read them silently, and we'll hear uh, what is the voice of the Lord. Verse 1, Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, and he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him. Now you'll remember, Abram is kind of the centerpiece of the story, Lot's his nephew. And Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. And he went by stages from the Negev to Bethel, the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had formerly been, and to the site where he had built the altar, back in chapter 12. And Abram called on the name of the Lord there. So he worshipped again. Now Lot, who was traveling with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land was unable to support them as long as they stayed together. For they had so many possessions that they could not stay together. And there was quarreling among the herdsmen, the shepherds, of Abram's uh, livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And at that time, there were Canaanites and Perizzites that lived in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please, let's not have quarreling between us and you, between you and me, our, or between our herdsmen and my herdsmen, since we're relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Separate from me, and if you go to the left, I'll go to the right, and if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot looked out, and he saw the entire plain of the Jordan, as far as, the, as Zoar, was well watered everywhere, just like the Lord's garden in the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Lot chose the entire plain of the Jordan to himself. And then Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, but Lot lived in the cities on the plain and set up his tent near Sodom. And now the men of Sodom were evil, sinning immensely against the Lord. After Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, Look, from the place where you are, look to the north and the south and the east and the west, and I will give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up and walk around this land um, that you have seen. Walk around this land through its length and through its width, and I'm going to give all of that to you. And so Abram moved his tent, and he went to the here, uh, near rather the oaks of Mamre in Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. All right, so in the story, we've seen so far that God calls Abram to go to the land of Canaan, and God obeyed, and so, or excuse me, Abram obeyed God. And so he goes to the land of Canaan. When he gets there, he sets up a couple of altars, and he worships the Lord. He calls on the name of God. He worships the Lord. And then at the end of chapter 12, he leaves for a little bit, and he goes down to Egypt. Now, this is important around Christmas time because you'll be reading the Christmas story and you'll be reminded that Jesus and his family, after he was born, went down to Egypt, and then they came back from Egypt as well. And so there's a foreshadowing here of what's going to happen at Christmas when uh, Jesus goes down into Egypt and he comes back again. It's a foreshadowing as well of uh, Moses leading his people out of Egypt, if you'll recall, that later in the story, the people of Israel go down into Egypt, they're slaves there for 400 years, and then they are delivered, and they come out of Egypt. So this idea this movement into Egypt and out of Egypt is important because it pictures for us what our lives are like. It, it really becomes a picture of what it is for us as human beings to have been uh, created in the image of God, to been, have been created in the land where God wanted human beings to live, and then to have journeyed out of that. And you and I, we, we live in Egypt, right? We're, we live in this foreign land. We live in a place where we're not at home. And as we uh, are brought back into what God has prepared for us and formed us, we're kind of formed us for, we're leaving Egypt, as it were. We're moving out of Egypt. We're going to see throughout the story of Genesis that Egypt is the place where you go if you want to get away from God, if you will. But the land, the, the land of Canaan, is the promised land, the place where you go to be in God's presence and to know God's blessing and to know God's favor. What, what you and I want to be as followers of Jesus is right in the middle of where God would have us to be, right in the middle of His land. 
And we see here in Abram's life this, this point of decision. There's some conflict that goes on between him and his nephew in this point of decision. And the decision is, are we going to trust God to go where he would have us to go, or are we going to go to the place that appears to be most appealing to us? What are we going to trust in, right? What is appealing and what uh, seems and appears to be providing for us what, what we might would think would be best and most wonderful and most glorious to have, or are we going to trust God? And so what happens in the story, as, you, as we read it, is that Lot and Abram have both uh, grown big enough in their families that they really needed to divide up. There wasn't enough space in the little place where they were. And so they're standing there between Bethel and Ai, and they're having to decide, where are we going to go from here? Now, Canaan is the place where God had called them to go, where God had called them to be. And so Abram says to Lot, and in the story, to put him in a place where the, the decision, the choice to obey God, to trust God, to go where he tells us to go and do what he tells us to do becomes evident within the text. And so it's Lot, you pick. Do you want to go where God has called us to go and God has called our family to go, or do you want to go to a different place? And Lot chooses, the Bible tells us, to go live in the cities on the plain, the cities of the plain, the city Sodom and Gomorrah, you may be familiar with those two cities, are going to come back up later in the story, and there's already an allusion to it here, right? They're going to be destroyed, and you might, might even know and remember that story. And so Lot chooses, I'd rather go down there and live, and the way that he describes what he sees when he looks down at the city of the plain is fascinating. That, fascinating. He says that everything is watered in the same way that the Lord's garden was watered, the same way the Lord's land, the land of God was, was watered. In other words, he looks at the, the cities on the plain. He looks at Sodom and Gomorrah, and he says, man, they've got everything that I need. There's nothing that's missing. There's nothing that's lacking. Everything I could want, everything I could need. Man, I take all my herds down there. I take all my sheep. I take all my family. I take all these people that are working for me, and we're going to move down there into the plain, and this is going to be wonderful. This is going to be great. For you and for me as Christians, this is the same sort of choice that we face. I mean, literally daily we face this choice, but in big ways we face the choice as well. God has called us to go in some direction, to follow after him, to trust in him, to go to a land that he has provided, but our, our eyes deceive us. Our eyes can deceive us, and, and they lie to us. We look out at the cities on the plain, and we think, man, that looks good. That would be awesome. That would be fabulous. It, it kind of reminds me of what Christmas was like for me when I was a little kid. When I was a kid, we got like the, the Sears catalog. I don't know, maybe your parents or you or your grandparents or whatever remember the Sears catalog. And I would sit there. I can, like even right now, in, in the eyes of my mind, I can see myself sitting in the chair going through that Sears catalog. And they had the whole section of the toys. And I'm like, I want that, and I want that, and I want that. And I'm circling. That's going to be great. And then I start to like, like visualize. This is like manifesting. You know what I mean? I'm like visualizing what it's going to be like to play with those toys. And I'm thinking, this is going to be incredible incredible man whenever I got these guys are fighting each other and you know, I'm like Star Wars characters are going against one another and and I'm I'm living this out in my mind and I'm building this up to the greatest thing and Christmas morning comes and we tear into the toys and there they are Santa's brought all of these toys to us if you will and I'm like this is amazing somehow Santa Claus knew to bring me the things that I had been looking at and had given to my parents and as I look at these toys I'm like this is going to be fabulous and for the next 15 or 20 minutes it's amazing it's unbelievable. Man, I play with the toys. It's great. And it's just like I envisioned. And then it wears off. And by the end of Christmas Day, I'm looking for the next thing. Well, what are we going to get for, you know, Valentine's Day? What's the next set of toys that's going to come? What's the next set of gifts that's going to come? And, and before long, the gifts get kind of shoved over to the side. And I've moved on to the other thing. In other words, they just weren't satisfying. And what happens in this story is that Lot sets him up, himself up for the kind of problem that you and I oftentimes face in our lives. When we choose to not do things God's way, when we choose not to dwell within his land, when we choose not to be in the middle of his will, it may seem like making that choice would bring us all sorts of happiness and bring us all sorts of fulfillment. But there's always something greater on the other side of it, something more that we have to get. It never brings the type of peace that what the presence of God brings to us. It's that kind of peace that God offers to Abram, and it offered to Lot, and Lot chooses the cities on the plain instead. As he describes here, this is a place where everything is watered, just like it was down in Egypt. Everything is provided. Whatever you want is there. 
It's a trust fund, right? This is the greatest thing that you could possibly ever, ever have. Abram, though, ends up in the cities on the, I mean, ends up in, in the, the rough area, in the Canaanite uh, cities, in the place where there was all sorts of enemies that lived, right? The Perizzites who lived there and the Canaanites who lived there. They didn't like that Abram was there. They didn't like that his family had come. They had run him off into Egypt previously, and now they're certainly not going to be happy that he's there. And so there's, there's conflict. The land where Abram goes to doesn't appear with his own eyes to be this place which is welcoming and which is inviting. And sometimes if we aren't careful, our eyes can tell us that God's will for our lives isn't inviting, that it, it's not something that's appealing to us. Our eyes can say if you go there, there's going to be, there are going to be enemies, there's going to be conflict, there may be difficulty that's there. You can walk over here and the cities are having a great time, and over here there's, there's only difficulty that you're going to encounter. But we're reminded in this story here that when Lot and his family and herdsmen end up in Sodom and Gomorrah, that eventually those cities become destroyed, that, that it ends. That what they thought was going to bring them such contentment, that was going to bring them such delight, ultimately is done away with. It disappears. It's gone. That these sorts of worldly uh, entertainments, they eventually go away. And what remains, what is left, is only what is eternal, only what God has given to us. And so let's look at the way that this unfolds for us and the story that Moses would tell us here in uh, recounting what Abram did. The first thing that we see is down in verse 4, or excuse me, in verse 3. In verse 3, we're told this, that he had gone down to the Negev, uh, that he had gone to Bethel, that he had uh, called on, in verse 4, then the name of the Lord at the same place that his tent had been before. There's this sense of returning to what God had called him to, a reminder of what God had promised to him, and now he returns to that promise. You see, instead of looking for something different than God's promise, he runs to God's promise. He, he goes right back to the place where he had already pitched his tents before, right back to the place where he had already built an altar previously, and now he calls on the name of the Lord. He offers worship to God, as it were, in the same place where he had been before as a reminder of his confidence in the promise of God. And what you and I sometimes, if we aren't careful, struggle with is really believing God's promise. And what we discover at the outset here in verses 3 and 4 is the, the confidence that Abram has in God's very promise. Man, every year we celebrate Christmas, right? And we come together and we put up Christmas trees and we uh, have fr friends and family who come along and we give gifts to one another. And whatever other traditions you have in your family, you're celebrating Christmas year after year after year. And what you and I have to to do this year is to not lose sight of why it is that we're doing all of those things. Right? Why, why is it that we celebrate in this time of the, the year? What, what are we actually focusing our attention on? And it is this return to the same altar that has been built before. We worship God not just you know, once a year we come together at Christmas, but week after week we come back to the same place where the, the tents have been pitched, right back to the same place where the altar's been built, right back to the same place where we heard God's promise and we went there because we trusted it. You and I are here today because we really do believe when God offers us hope that He will come through. I mean, we, re we really trust Him for that. And so we come back each week kind of looking for that time and that day where God keeps his promise in our lives, where God brings to an end our sin and brings to an end our suffering and brings to an end death and disease, and he really does establish this land that he has promised to establish, and so we keep trusting and we keep believing and we keep calling on the name of the Lord. We keep coming back. You know, sometimes we can be tempted to give up, right? We can uh, be pushed off into Egypt and think, I just don't know that God's going to keep his promise or not. I don't know that he can trust him. I mean, there are people who, who grow up in church and they hear the message of the gospel and they, they might believe the facts of the gospel, but this real sense of having a relentless devotion to God and his promises that are, that are executed for us in Jesus ends up, ends up missing. And our devotion to Christ and our trust in him begins to wane and our religion just becomes an exercise that we engage in if we aren't careful. It can be just going through the motions, you know, week after week or year after year. We just kind of do the same things 
And it becomes religion and not relationship. It becomes this act of our own flesh as opposed to a trust in God. And rather than abiding in the place where God has made us to, to live, we start to look around. Are there other cities that are greater than the city that we're, that we're in right now? Our failure to trust in God's promises lead us to, to no longer worship God, to call on His name. But you and I, we demonstrate our trust in God's promises and our hope that He has given to us by believing Him and by acting in worship, by calling on His name. Things perhaps this year have been difficult for you, and there may be difficulties that you do face and that you will face. Just know this, that God has promised to be present with you in the midst of all of those things. Call on His name. Reach out to Him. Be like Abram here. There's no sense here that when Lot travels down to the cities of the plain that he calls on the name of the Lord. Lot, in many ways, is, is the person who is traveling along with Abram, which is kind of the next part of the story, traveling along with Abram, and when he has a chance, an opportunity to go somewhere else, he goes and he forgets the Lord. And so there is this confidence, this relentless devotion to Christ, this confidence in God's promises that we see in Abram, and then there's the opposite of that in Lot. There's instead a confidence in the things of the world, a confidence in what his eyes tell him are the greater possessions to have. And when he looks down at the cities on the plain, he's like, this looks like the Garden of Eden. (laughs) Why would I not want to go there? It's because it's not the Garden of Eden. It's not the promised land. Don't let your eyes deceive you. The first place that we saw in Genesis, someone's eyes deceiving them is with Eve, right? Adam and Eve are in the garden and they stand before the tree and the text tells us that when Eve looks at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it appears to be good for food. It's pleasing to the eyes and so she reaches up and she, and she takes it. That the enemy used her, her own desires, her own eyes to lead her astray from what God would give to her, the good things of God, the blessings of God, life and the land, and instead she let her eyes lead her astray. And Abram here is is faced with the same choice, and Lot chooses to let his eyes lead him astray, and Abram chooses to trust in God's promises. You think, well, man, I can't see the hope, like it's unseen in front of me. There's no evidence of the hope that lies before me, which is why it's faith. Hebrews tells us that faith is the evidence of things that are not yet seen. Right? We, we, we don't see, when we look around at the world around us, we don't see the end of injustice. We don't see the end of suffering. Everywhere we look, we see just the opposite. There are wars and rumors of wars and conflict and injustice and harm and disease and sin. And we think, wow, with all of this, where is God? And God, if you will, is in the manger. God comes to us in Christ to fulfill this promise to us that He will lead us into his land. And so we have to trust. We've got to be like Abram in the story. Believe what God tells us that, we're, that he's going to do. And don't be like Lot. Don't let our eyes deceive us and lead us to a place. Don't go eastward, in other words. Look, here's the thing. There's a very important part of reading the Bible. We've talked about this before, but it's a lesson for us. If there's ever anyone who's calling you to go to the east, don't do it. Like always, you go west, young man. You know what I mean? Like if if there's someone who's calling, hey, come to the east, the city's here great, the valley's here great, the plain's here great, you're like, hmm. It's sort of like, you know, somebody from Nigeria offering you millions of dollars around Christmas. Like, don't do it. Delete the email. Don't go to the east. And a lot, we're told here, goes eastward, moving away further and further from where God would, would have him to be. So what, what about us? I mean, it, do, do our lives look like those who are pursuing these cities that look like, appear to be wonderful, appear to be like a Garden of Eden, but really are just a mirage, that don't produce, don't give to us what they promise to us. And can we instead of looking with our our fleshly eyes, if you will, can we look with spiritual eyes to see what God has promised us and to trust Him? And to say, I'm just going to be that kind of follower of Jesus where I'm relentlessly devoted to Christ. What we're striving for to, for each of us as, as individual followers of Jesus and as a church is to just be a place that does one thing and one thing only. We just follow Jesus relentlessly. 
with the greatest kind of devotion to what, what He has promised to us and has provided for us in His own life and death and resurrection from the dead. And we just want to give ourselves over to that, knowing that the cities on the plain may for a moment be watered just like the Garden of Eden was, and they may provide for us the same kind of uh, excellencies as Egypt provides, but before long the cities will burn to the ground. Jesus says it this way. He says, look, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? Not treasures that can be burned up or that someone can come in and steal from you. Now, the point is not don't have things, like don't have a house. Well, it can burn to the ground, so I'm just going to like live on the street now. It's not that is what he's saying. He says "Your, your treasure is where your heart is. Where's your devotion? What are you truly devoted to? Man, are we devoted to kind of the, the, the world and the things of the world? Are we devoted to Christ? Abram here says, I'm just going to follow after where God calls me to go. I'm going to go to the city, or excuse me, I'm going to go to the land where he has promised to provide for me his own presence and the the place where he would have us to be. And a part of this promise that God gives to Abraham is is, we can't miss it. It's vitally important for us, and it's this promise that he's going to have these offspring. He's going to have children. Now, we've already seen there was a promise he's going to have a son, a descendant, and now he's going to have many descendants. There's going to be one son of Abraham. He's going to be the means by which the nations are blessed. And that blessing of the nations is bringing them into this new family where we become sons and daughters of Abraham. I love the way Galatians put this, that the sons and daughters of Abraham are not those who are physically born of him, but those who have faith the same way that he did. The faith that we see here in chapter 13. Being a son or a daughter, an offspring of Abram, the, and, and receiving the promise that is made to them is not by who is our mom or our dad. It's who is the object of our faith. Do we trust in Jesus Christ? And if so, then we're sons and daughters of Abraham. When you were a kid, if you went to church, you probably sang the little song, you know, Father Abraham has many sons or whatever. If you remember that, if you don't, Good for you. But if you did, you learned that little song, and you can't think about Abraham without singing the song, you know, and it's right arm, left arm, or left arm, right arm. You know, it's, it can be like this song reminds us of the fact that by faith, by faith, we're children of Abraham. What God has called us to is to trust, like just believe in him. The struggle that you and I face is we have such confidence in ourselves or we have such confidence in, in other things within the world that we think, man, can I really trust God? I, I don't see oftentimes everything that he is doing. And sometimes it's just because I close my eyes to what he's doing. There's so many great works that God has done around us. When Abram gets to the promised land, what he discovers is a place where he can live. And so he sets up an altar there, and he says, this is the place. And even when he wanders off into Egypt and falls into sin whenever he's down in Egypt, he comes back to that place again because it's been established. And what you and I either have done or must do in our lives as Christians is to establish that place, to say, I'm going to trust Jesus Christ and him alone for the forgiveness of my sins, for eternal life. And that's going to be the place where I'm going to stake my life And even if I've wandered away, I'm coming back. And perhaps the Christmas season this year is a time for some of us who have wandered to to make our way back. Maybe you're in Egypt today. Or maybe you're standing there on the mountain looking over at the plains and you're looking over at Canaan and you're trying to decide, which direction am I going to go? Am I going to make my way back to the place where there was this altar to the Lord and call on His name? Or for the first time, am I going to establish this altar? Or am I instead going to just follow the herd down to the cities on the plain. Abram becomes the example to us. I'm going to trust, I'm going to believe, I'm going to obey, make my way to Canaan, and the story ends this way, verse 18, that Abram moved his tent. Now, it's important, don't miss this, right? He has his tent established there between Bethel and Ai, the place where he had built the, the, the uh, altar before. And he had gone there and he had set his tents there, and he's like, this is where I'm going to be, and I'm going to stay in this place. But there was no contentment to just stay. There was movement. And why was he moving? He was moving to the Oaks of Mamre near Hebron for a very important reason. It's this. Because in order to 
occupy all of the land, to enjoy all that God had called him to and had offered to him. It wasn't sufficient that he just stay in one simple place. And the same thing's true for us spiritually. It's, it's not enough that we just trust in Jesus and we've been saved and now it's like, okay, well, I'll keep coming back to that at Easter or I'll keep coming back to that at Christmas or I'll keep coming to back to that on Sundays. It is that we have to constantly be moving in our lives as followers of Jesus, that we're constantly growing, that it's not enough to just worship at, at, at Bethel. We also have to make our way to Hebron as well. Everywhere we go in our lives, we're establishing these altars, if you will, to the Lord, calling on his name. And so he built this altar to the Lord there as well. There are a lot of areas in our lives that we have to submit to the, to the rule of Christ, to the lordship of Christ. It may be that we've trusted in Jesus, and there are certain areas of my life, God, you get every Sunday, but the rest of the week, so it's mine. Well, maybe Monday, maybe this week it's Monday, right? Maybe, maybe Hebron for you this week is, is Monday. You're going to, okay, Monday, you got this, Lord. Maybe it's where you work. Maybe it's where your family is. Maybe it's other areas of your life where you continue to submit them to the rule of Christ, to have the Spirit of God occupy each one of those spheres of your own life. You know, a lot of times we talk about in our church that the world's not a pancake, right? So you know what a pancake's like, right? Pancake is, is, is the lazy man's breakfast or the lazy woman's breakfast. So if you have pancakes, what do you do? They sit there on the plate, you put the butter on the top, you put the syrup on the top, and it just runs everywhere. It's real easy. It's real lazy. Having pancakes is, is, is lazy. But then there's waffles. Now, waffles are amazing. It's the best breakfast that you could have, and you put the waffle out. But there's a big difference between waffles and pancakes, right? Pancakes, you pour the syrup on, and it just runs everywhere. Waffles, if you want the syrup to be all over the place and not just be eating dry waffle, then you have to put the syrup in each one of those little, little containers, right? And so it takes some time to make it happen. But there's also great joy in doing this because you know, like you've been there, as you're pouring the syrup on, you're watching it fill each one of the holes. You're like, oh, this is going to be amazing, right? You don't ever think that about pancakes. Pancakes, you just pour it and you start eating. But a waffle, like, like you're enjoying it even before you take the first bite. But you're filling every one of those squares with the syrup. And the same thing's true with the gospel, right? Your life's, your life's not a pancake. You don't just show up on Sunday and the gospel gets poured over you and it just kind of runs out in every area of, of, of our lives. We have to look at our lives like having all of these different spheres, all of these different squares. We, you're a waffle. And what you and I have to do is we have to ensure that we're submitting each one of those squares to the gospel in every part of our lives. And what we find is that the more we do that, the more we enjoy what God has offered to us. But we're only going to, to fill each one of those squares if we really trust in what God has promised to us, if we really believe that he has accomplished in Jesus what he said he was going to accomplish, and that is this, to, to, to establish an offspring, a people who are born from Abraham that will inherit a land, a land where God is present with us, and it's a land that flows with milk and honey, if you will. It's a land that's more enjoyable and more precious and more excellent than any other land that we could possibly ever imagine. And if we believe that to be true, then every little area of our life we, we fill with the gospel. And the encouragement for us this morning is at this time of the year to like come back. Like If, if you've been in Egypt, come back, back out of Egypt. It's not the end of the world that you went to Egypt. It's not even the end of the world that you went down to the plains and the cities that are there. Come back and make your way not just to, to Bethel, but make your way to Hebron. And beyond that, to all of these other places, as far to the north and as far to the south and as far to the east and as far to the west, as you can look in your own life, see God working there and enjoy his presence. In so many ways, your life being a waffle filling each one of those squares with the gospel. You finally look at this and you think, this is what God has meant. This is what God has intended. And so trust in him. Build an altar. Trust in the name of the Lord and call on him. Perhaps even today for the first time. But trust in him today and tomorrow and every day after this. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning uh, yet again for this passage of Scripture the reminder to us that you have, um, 
placed us wherever we are in our lives so that we would know you are near to us, and you have given to us this, this option to, to trust you and to believe you, um, to believe your, your promises, even those that we can't see, to trust that you will do what you have said you were going to do on the basis of you having already done what you said you were going to do, having established that you are faithful in every situation to now give the situations of our lives over to your faithfulness. And so would you hear our prayers as we call out to you even today? Uh, Would you um, fulfill your promise in our lives even now? Help us to be the kind of people, the kind of church, the kind of followers of Jesus that really are relentlessly devoted to Christ in everything that we do. And so would you fill us up by your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together. And while we sing, man, if you'd like to pray with somebody or talk with someone, maybe you'd like to discover how you can trust in Jesus or maybe how you can be a part of a church like this that really seeks to be this place where God's presence is known and practiced and experienced, um, then we would love to talk with you about those things. Maybe you just want to pray with somebody else. You can come and, and pray with someone even this morning. Let's stand together, and as we, uh, as we sing, you feel free to come even now. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to be he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my strength has love my deep and boundless peace to this I God is present with us. And I'm not sure where you are in your life. You may be in the midst of darkness right now. Know this, that the light of the gospel pushes back the darkness. Like God is present with us in the midst of our suffering, our hurt, our pain, whatever that is. And know that, that God calls us to rejoice, to celebrate in that, very, in that very fact. And so what a delight it is to celebrate uh, each week together uh, with you. So Ben's going to come now. He's going to share a couple things with us, a couple of highlights, and then uh, we'll uh, be dismissed with a word of prayer. Yeah, so, thanks. So uh, this Wednesday and next Wednesday, we have our anxiety, depression, and grief seminars. Uh, they'll be in the chapel, 630 to 730 uh, after dinner. And so what I want you to know this morning is that life is hard, that we all experience difficulties. We all experience grief of all different kinds. Grief is not, doesn't just come from loss of loved ones. It comes in many different ways. And so our goal this week and next week is to uh, educate you, to, to provide you with some materials, to raise awareness, to equip you to deal with these things better. Um, but most of all, really honestly, is to help you know that you're not alone. 
when we experience things like anxiety, depression, and grief, the enemy uses it to tell you that you are by yourself and to put you into a pit where you can't see the light of day anymore and to beat you down. And I, I want you to know, we want you to know as a church that you're not alone and that uh, as a church family, we want you to find healing. We want to come along beside you and help in any way that we can. And most of all, we want you to know that God is with you, that he sees you and he cares about you and he loves you, and he is still there. And so if you, if you are experiencing these things, if you know people that are experiencing these things, it doesn't have to be someone that, that has recent loss, that, that has recently been struggling with anxiety or anything like that. Invite anyone you know. Just, just put it out there. There might be people in your life that are dealing with these things, but they're hiding it and hiding it well. And so just invite friends, invite family, put it out there. This is open to the community. This is not something that's just for those of you who are sitting in the seats right now. We want this to be open to the community. We'll have a couple of people uh, who are licensed counselors from the community here on Wednesday. So we'll be talking with them, and that'll be the main way that we learn through these seminars both weeks. But then also we'll have a time for questions. And so uh, you can come and you can ask questions of me or of them. And if you don't feel like asking your question um, live during the seminar, we'll have ways for you to uh, submit questions anonymously as well. And so we're really hoping that this is a blessing to you and to your family. We have sign-ups in the bulletin just so we know how many people to expect. That's the only reason we're doing sign-ups. Uh, but we also have a, a paper sheet on the Welcome Center on the desk. And if you don't want to put your name for whatever reason, if, if you just want to put two adults on there or whatever like that, you can do that as well. Um, but again, we just want to be prepared, and <clears throat> if you're coming, if you're not, please be in prayer for it. This, these are important topics, especially this time of year, so please be praying over these seminars, and as we go into 2024, our goal is to launch some uh, counseling groups, and so we will try to launch a grief counseling group and an anxiety and depression counseling group that will go through some curriculum together, and we'll meet once a week in the evenings here at the church. And so I, I'm going to just throw that out there just so you know. There'll be more information, of course, coming to you uh, as we get closer. But that's also another way we want to uh, provide for you and help you, uh, help support you, help you know that, again, you're not alone in these struggles and life struggles and that, that God is with you. So uh, please be praying about the seminars this week. Be thinking about who you can invite and come. And as you can tell, I'm, I'm very passionate about it myself. Um, and I look forward to the blessing that it will be for us, for our church family, and for our community as well. So will you pray with me to close? Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for an opportunity to understand you, to understand your love, to understand the good things that you have for us. Father, help us to make good choices in this life. We have the opportunity. You give us freedom to, to go any direction that we want to go, to go to the east, to go to the west, to go closer to you, to go further away from you. And so, Father, just this week, help us to deepen our relationship with you. Help us to understand how good it is to walk with you and to not just experience your presence here uh, in, in these four walls on Sunday, but to experience your presence every single day. And so, Lord, help us. Help us this week. Whatever it is that, that we have, if it's just one small hurdle to jump this week, if it's just one step of faithfulness that, that grows our relationship with you this week, then Lord, give us the strength, courage, and wisdom to do it. Help us to draw into you each and every day to grow in our relationship with you, to understand the breadth and the depth of your incredible love for us, Lord, and to be salt and light in this community uh, because of it. Father, we love you and we trust you. Help us to do those things more every day. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.